It's time for Mac Geek Gab, and listener Bob brings us brings brings us our quick tip of the week by saying, "I think I tripped over something that I never knew might benefit others." Uh, if you swipe up from the lower left corner of an iPad screen, uh, he says. I'm not sure if it's directly up or towards the center. He says, as I'm still discovering it, it's more towards the center, Bob, I think is the right way to describe that. Yep. You do that. Swipe up from the lower left corner of the iPad screen. It takes a screenshot. Bob says he never knew this uh, and figured he'd share. Thank you for sharing, Bob. More tips like this. Plus your questions answered today on Mac Geek Gab 970 for Monday, February 27th, 2023. <laughs> And welcome, indeed, to Mac Geek Up, the show where we share tips just like that, your questions, your cool stuff found. We try to answer your questions. These are questions that you, yes, you, can send in to us at feedback at macgeekgab.com. We try to share your questions, answer your questions, share your tips, share your cool stuff found. The go- we put it together into an agenda. Uh, we try to have some fun with it. The goal is... Every single one of us learns at least five new things every week when we get together. There it is. And sometimes Pete will even play that sound, which clearly he still has some echo cancellation on because it sounded pretty wonky. Uh, Sponsors for this episode include Collide. We're at collide.com slash MGG. You get a device security solution that uses Slack and educates your users. It's now tailor made for Okta. We'll talk more about that in depth in a minute as well rocketmoney.com slash mgg they will cancel your subscriptions for you they'll help you monitor your spending it can save you hundreds per year again rocketmoney.com slash mgg we'll talk about that in a little bit too for now here in durham new hampshire at least while we're recording this i'm dave hamilton and here in fairfield connecticut this is jennifer brun and here at an undisclosed bunker somewhere in the United States. <laughs> I have no idea where I am today. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's Pilot Pete. And let me say to the people that are listening live today, right now, as we record, happy Mardi Gras. And to all of you listening on the show, I hope you're well into your Lenten self-deprivation because it's there you uh, go. now Lent. <laughs> That's right. We are recording early. I said I'm in, I'm in Durham while we yeah. record this. I'm going to be in Cancun uh we're, we're going to, to stand barefoot in the sand and, and watch fish on the beach for, uh, for a few days. So giving that's where we will be. For Lent, are you Dave? <laughs> uh, it turns out I am giving up snow for Lent. Yes. Uh, we're, we're getting, we actually, we got a little bit of snow the morning that we recorded this, but we're supposed to get like another eight inches or something over the next couple of days. So hopefully if the power does go out, my, gen, my standby generator, the, the silly, uh fix that they were supposed to have done to that actually works i can't control that though so we're just going to do the show and uh hope and you know we'll figure it out todd has our todd has our next tip our our next quick tip he says i use the mac os calendar and i you and i used to use the go to date uh, screen uh, keyboard shortcut command shift T to go to a date. That same keyboard shortcut works in busy Cal, by the way. Uh, but back to Apple calendar, Todd takes us lately. He says, I have found it easier to click on the year button at top center. Now I have the entire year in front of me and I can simply, simply quick click quick. I can easy for me to say, I can Dude, you simply got, you need to get some new lips, man. This is you're having a rough day. <laughs> Clearly, I already have Mexico on the brain and I can simply click on the day I want. Need a different year. Click on the left, right arrows uh, in the upper right to move years. He says, somehow I find this easier than the go to date shortcut. Then typing the month tab, type the day tab, type the year says you can use the arrow keys to change those numbers up and down as well but the year view works fine for me no i can i get this especially and i we all visualize things differently uh you know for example time i visualize on an on an analog watch right even if i'm reading digital time my brain translates it the calendar i think of as like this uh you know the and I can't remember the, the the name of the the ride, but it's it's the the thing where it goes fast the enough that it sticks you the roundup exactly. Yeah. 
that's how I think of a calendar, but I think about it um, like in, in almost a, a 3D view. It's, it's bizarre, right? So uh, maybe it's bizarre. Maybe it's how everybody does. I don't know, but it's what works for me. So I can totally see where for at least some of us clicking and seeing the year view to then navigate, let your brain stay in whatever visual mode your brain is in as opposed to having to translate it to, yeah, I want to see July 27th. Now I need to think about that. That's actually July, the number 27 in the year, you know, by typing it in, I can totally see how that, that makes sense. And if this was far too much of a glimpse into my, uh, my ready for Cancun brain, well, sorry, but thanks Todd. That's a good one. I like these tips. I, I like, I like, I like workflow tips that, that, you know, can make things more efficient. It's good stuff. I don't know. I, if, how do you navigate around the calendar, Pete? Uh, I generally just go to date. I like the month view. Um, and, you know, I, I've never given it much thought. When I need to go to a year, I, I seem, or, you know, to a previous year or something, I, I'll go to the year view and then scroll up or down. I've never, yeah. He's I've using never... the year view for, like, this year. That's the yeah. part, like, just to get to a date, even if it's, yeah. you know, in two months or something. So. I, yeah. I find myself working in this month and next month so often that that I generally just look at month view. In fact, I get a little screwed up. If I if I get down into the week view, I feel like I'm looking at my data through a straw. You know, the whole iPhone screen is too small. Yeah. yeah. The, week, the week view is too small on the phone. Most yeah, the I, I, mean, I use the- BusyCal on both and uh, on both Mac OS and iOS. The, the week view on BusyCal, even in portrait mode, is is right for me i can see i think i've got it set to okay. see three or four days at a time which the way i work my life is 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 right but on my desktop i see 14 days at a time in week view in busy cal uh, and okay. and that really lets me have a picture of what's going on and if i need to change time zones i can change time zones in busy cal and it obviously shifts things around and i can see two time zones at once if i want yeah. it so um I will say this, yeah, yeah, taking yeah. time zones, though, I anchor my, my laptop never leaves Eastern time. You said that. So, yeah, yeah so it makes I sense. wherever I am in the world, I leave that on Eastern time. My watch and my phone are local time and that sort of thing. But I always know what time it is at home. And then I never have to worry about, did my calendar alert or alarm cue me at the right time? So if I'm out on the West Coast oh, and I have yeah. a recording at 1 p.m. Eastern time, then it you know at nine thirty Pacific time I get hey thirty minutes to recording oh yeah yeah okay, there you go so yeah that makes sense so, yeah. yeah okay I mean yeah. it would do that it does even a nice job I will say the phone comes up with hey you know it's nine thirty local and and you've got a recording in half an hour okay yeah so it does a nice job of anchoring but that way yeah I was gonna say I change I let my time zones change in my calendar and I never I, well I shouldn't say never yeah. I almost never have an issue with uh with with it you know because it, it just adapts it knows right. it, where i have an issue is when people I, I i've got mine set so i don't create events like this i don't mean to say that i'm like perfect and somehow can never make a mistake but this mistake i have engineered against i've protected myself against however if i get an event from someone else that is in what my calendar refers to as floating time zone aka no time zone that screws me up because if I'm home, let's say when I put that in, it now is in Eastern time. If I then, and my calendar will now make it Eastern time, regardless of what it was supposed to be. So if somebody, if I'm meeting somebody at 2 PM central in Austin next month, uh, and they send me a floating time zone event, I put it in as 2 PM, uh, uh you know, that's going to be a problem. So, cause it'll, because it'll adapt to 1 p.m. Austin time, or uh, yeah, one that would be 1 p.m. Austin time Central. So anyway, yeah. Anything to add to that, John? I got, yeah, (laughs) right. Zulu convert. Yeah, exactly. Um, when I schedule events, like when we were um in another time zone, I'll typically schedule it while I'm here, but I'll subtract or add the hours so that when I do get into the time zone, um, everything is correct interesting so why do you i'm curious why you even have to bother i mean if you put it in it at you know like pete said 1 p.m eastern time if your time zone on your devices changes it will be 10 a.m 
Pacific time. Like I, you don't need to overthink that. I don't un, unless unless you've experienced something that informs you that you do need to overthink that. But but that's what I'm saying is if I put stuff in as long as the time zone's not floating, which is rare. That that's that's very much an, an asterisk scenario. Mo, for yeah. the most part, all events come in with a time zone assigned, and then, that, then it's it's just converted from Zulu time, like like you said, Pete. It's it's always yeah. anchored to Zulu time. Everything is, yeah, right. So I mean, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, there's more to add to that, John. Do you have any context for that or? Nope. Okay. Um. I was working with one of my bandmates recently. We, with one of the bands I, I mean, we use a Google calendar to share dates and all of that. Uh, we, we recently changed the calendar that we use. I'm still not sure why we, we did that. We had one Google calendar. We moved to another one. Not sure why, but anyway, what that meant was it's a brand new calendar. And one of the guys texted me and said, I can't get this to add to my iPhone. It doesn't show up in the list. I'm like, oh, it shows up fine for me. And then I thought, well, wait, I'm using BusyCal. I'm just logging that into my Google account its own way. Let me look on my iPhone, you know, and see. And sure enough, I couldn't see it either in my iPhone calendar. And I'm like, what's going on here? It had been so long that I had forgotten about the secret Google calendar iPhone select screen. It's ridiculous what I'm about to tell you. If you if you haven't experienced this before, great. Maybe you never will. And if you have, you're going, right, I remember this. When you have calendars in Google Calendar, by default, most of them will not be exposed to your iPhone when it tries to you know, generate a list of calendars for you to either show or not show. You have to log into Google and go to a URL. I'll say the URL, but it's also in the show notes at MacGeekab.com. You have to go to Google.com slash calendar slash iPhone select. And it's this horribly laid out. Like it looks like a very programmer written screen that never got any styling or anything. But it's this ridiculous screen and with checkboxes next to the names of your calendars. And you have to check the names of your calendars that you want to appear uh, and be exposed to your iPhone. And then on your phone, you can choose whether to have them appear or not. It's crazy. It's crazy. So that's that. Um, so I share that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, so that's what I got. You want to take us to Robbie, John? Will. I will. Um Robbie says, I don't have many shortcuts that are real beneficial to me and have not explored the shortcut app capabilities until recently. I've listened to you guys talk about creating a shortcut to manipulate low power mode on the iPhone and some other shortcuts people have made. After exploring around in the shortcuts recently, I saw you could send a text message when something happens. And I thought, why would I want to send a text message when the Apple display results on the screen for me to see? Uh, now to the tip, my mother is in the elderly category. And a couple of days ago I was visiting her. I looked at her phone only to see it was in low power mode because the battery battery was almost dead. She does not answer my calls when her phone is dead. <laughs> um, the elderly people occasionally forget to plug in the phone to recharge. Then it came to me. I need to make a shortcut automation on her phone that sends me a text message when it goes into low power mode or the battery drops below some percentage so I can call her before the phone dies and tell her to plug the phone in. Cool. I like it. That yeah. doesn't work when your 97 year old mother has a flip phone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just oh, saying. <laughs> right. But the, fortunately one of those phones will last, you know, four days on a charge. So <laughs> uh, that's fair. That, that's a really good point. Yeah. My dad gets his iPhone to last like three or four days on a charge. Um, uh, I yeah I don't know what the magic is I, I mean I do it's yeah. that he doesn't have a ton of apps on there that he uses all the time um, and I bet he's, he's got you know, four minutes a day of screen time right that's what that's really what it is <laughs> yes it, that's exactly screen. right <laughs> <laughs> my dad is not glued to his screen he's a pretty technical guy but but yeah he's not it's it, it, like being technical and having a screen addiction uh, yeah. it turns out are not uh, one and the same. Right. You you can you can be technical and and have somehow avoided having a screen addiction. 
I've uh-huh. long since deleted it, but years ago I was in a restaurant in California and there was an entire family sitting at, we're out, out to dinner and they're all sitting there on their phones, yep. with, you know, playing with their screens. And I snapped a picture of it and put it up on Twitter and wrote, you know, the, the hashtag togetherness. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I, like I say, I since deleted that, but, uh, oh, sorry. All right. Know. Yeah. All right, uh, Nick has uh, the next quick tip for us. This is, I, I love that this stuff happens. Um, he says you can, uh, in Apple Notes, using an Apple Pencil, you can write tags, I, This is, which is amazing to me. He says what you write is, you know, you, you draw with your pencil the, the hash sign, the sign, the pound sign, whatever you want to call that. And your tag words. So if you, you know, if you're making a note about this show, you can, you can write, you know, hash Mac geek gab then. So now you've got that just written scribbled in your own version of scribble. Uh, then you go back and tap on the word and a pop-up will come up and turn it into a tag. So if you're listening to the show and taking notes, I know some of you do, uh, it, it, you don't, it's certainly not mandatory, obviously when I mean, there's no gun, there's not, it's not going to be any quiz. Uh, but, uh, but if you're doing that, write it, and uh and then just tap on it and it pops up if uh and af- offers to turn it into a tag he's he's got some context and some tips here about this nick says this works best if you put the tags on a new line and sometimes you have to scroll the tag off the top of the page and then scroll it back for notes to process it and recognize it as a potential tag so thank you for that uh that quick tip and the context of actually getting it to work in the right way. Love it. Love it. Love it. It's cool stuff. Fun. Um, yes. Sir. Tags allow you to then search for an item with that tag at a later time. That's yes. Good question. That's exactly right. Yep. Cause I'm like, I don't think I've ever used tags. So yeah. All right. Yeah. Clear that up. Yeah. Now, tags now and notes. Will. Yeah. It's, it's yet another compartmentalization organizational uh, tool that you can use. Yeah. And, and you're right. That's perhaps the buried, uh, buried lead here is, yeah, is, right. is that, that, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Get that into exactly. your workflow. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. which, which fun should stuff help obviate, should help obviate the need for find any file. Sorry. Now you got to put that in the show notes. <laughs> find any file. Oh, the, 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 the cool little, stuff found. It's, yeah. The well, little freeware app. Uh, Will that it. search notes too? find any I bet, file? I think it searches any. You can, it gets really granular. You can go down into, you know, I want a, a PDF file with the word, you know, silly in it. And, you know, you can, the contents is, and it's really granular. And it will, it will search your network drives, your attached storage. Um, that is super, it's super powerful. I find it to be faster than Spotlight and certainly better. You, like I say, you can get more granular. You can say, I want this type of file. I want, it has these contents. Yeah. That sort of thing. So. I, I gotta, I, I know I have it. It's, it's not in my, um, it's not, you know, it's not in my, yeah. my, my default. Like my fingers don't know to just launch it and use it when I need to do Man, a thing. I'll tell you, Dave, it's, uh, we mentioned it on the show several months back when it first came up and yeah. It, it, it quit. That's one of the ones that quickly fell into my workflow. Find any file in, I think he, had, I, I think it was a $5 donation is what's requested. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, but, it's, it's like Thomas Templeman apps or something like that. I think he, yeah, he's the one that makes it. Yeah. yeah. Super, super powerful little app. Cool. So. Cool. All right. Uh, Craig has a little something to share back in episode 967. Pete, you were sharing the issue with your AirPods auto connecting to your phone when a call comes in. Mm -hmm. And Craig's been through this. He says this will happen unless you configure a setting known as connect when last connected in your AirPods setup. Uh, He says... And that way, when you you need, so he says you need to go to each device, connect the AirPods and then enable this setting. So that, cause that's the only time you can change those settings. The default setting is automatically. And that's, what's driving you crazy is that it bounces things around. He says the, the setting is device specific and does not travel with the AirPods. This does defeat that auto connect feature that you, uh, that you ran into. So thank you for that, Craig. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty good. Yep. Um, 
On the subject of AirPods and very specifically the second generation AirPods Pro, Mark in uh, Mark M, I shall say, in our Discord channel says, uh, I just found out by accident and turns out necessity. I forgot to bring a charger for my AirPods Pro Gen 2, but I did bring my Apple Watch puck charger. Turns out you can charge your AirPods Pro case, uh, Gen 2 case, on the Apple Watch puck. He says, this might be old news to many, but it's news to me. I, it, I, when I read this, I, like, I had some memory of it, but I, I don't, I think if somebody asked me, can I do this? I would have said no. Uh, so yeah, that, interesting. See, I missed that it was the second generation and I'm like, yeah, I tried several times with the puck and the, and the AirPods pro first generation. Yeah. Yeah. It never did work. Here's the other cool thing about AirPods pro second generation. If you have a case with an air tag. On yeah, it to find your, your AirPods, you no longer need that because it makes the exact same. There's an AirTag built into the AirPods Pro second generation case. Correct. So yeah, it it, yeah. Will, it works with Find My perfectly, makes the same sound, and now you've got an extra AirTag to you know. Right. Yeah, yeah. it's so smart. So that, you I mean, it's... your wife. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry. Did I say yeah. that out loud. <laughs> well, yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, like for the people that are in, in your family, you get you can see where they are, and you can see yeah. where uh, you know their, their devices. Yeah. I think even are. Yeah, they did change, and I, I like. There are times when this is frustrating to me, but I, I understand, and it's good, and I, I'm appreciative for the change. It used to be that I could set an alert to tell me when, you know, when alert me, when my wife, uh, you know, leaves the house so that I know, yeah, you know, that she'll meet, meet me at the club or whatever. Um, now I can still do that, but it alerts my wife that I have started actively getting notifications about her, her location. Yeah, what up with that Apple? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> How are we, it's are good we supposed to be creepy Apple. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I get it right. I'm totally yeah. with, with, yeah. I, like, I understand why it happens. I just, I had gotten so used to doing it like, <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to just sit at my desk and sort of plow through, you know, my to-do list but when my wife gets home, we're going to go out to dinner or, or, you know, do a thing, whatever, you know. And right. so I would set an alert to tell me, oh, she she just left, you know, the gym and she's on her way home. Now I know I've got 20 minutes to wrap up the one thing I'm in, get changed or whatever. And off I go. And I've stopped doing that because I because, well, I, I, I suppose because I never told her in the past that I did that. Um, not that it, I was using it for like creepy reasons, but I realized, oh, if I do, if now, if I do this, she's going to get notifications. She's going to think I'm stalking her, which obviously I am, uh, you know, she's going to be hundred percent correct about that. But, yeah. but yeah, the, the convenient, I have stopped using it for convenience. Let Maybe me, that, that's the way to say it. And I, I, I don't like that. Maybe I just need to just start doing it again and, and tell say, her, hey, don't, don't worry it, about yeah. this. Yeah, well, yeah exactly. And, and yeah. she'll understand. And let me, let me clarify for the, for the listeners that don't know your setup. You're in a separate building across the driveway from your home and you don't have the, you have the windows blacked out for studio reasons. Correct. So you can't see or hear when she pulls up in the driveway. So well, I, yeah, I do she, now because she, she now that she drives that WRX, that thing's loud. Oh, so but <laughs> if I have go. headphones in, I won't hear it. Sure. Right? Yeah. Like yeah. So exactly. Yeah. But here's the other thing that they've they've also done because this creeped my daughter out last summer, I believe it was, when she went to work and she got she got home that night and then it notified her, hey, someone's air tag is with you. And she's like, um, really? Is I'm pulling in the driveway? You're finally notifying me? Well, it was on my keys. She had borrowed sure. my car yeah. to go to work. And yeah. It was on my keys. But now I think it says Pete's AirTag is with you. Yeah. It, so it, it tells you whose it is. It, yep. Well, you know, per the name that's that's stored in there. So. Yep. So. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I get that too. And it's weird when it decides to notify you. Because if I take my wife's car... It, it you know she often will leave her purse just in the car in in the garage and if I'm going out to you know pick up you know Chinese food or something I yeah. just go take it and it's like you know I, I'm almost back home with the food and it's like you know someone's air tag is with you it's like well 
It's a heck of a time to tell me. Thanks yeah. for that. Yeah, and there's a pull in my driveway. <laughs> now they know yeah. where I live. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks for – yeah, exactly. Good, good thing I had no opportunity to lose them. Uh, Pete, you had a, a, a great little – quick tip that you shared in in pre-show would you would you share it again now for me yeah please? so how many times have you ever said been told in your iphone hey go to settings go to uh, here's a classic one because it's it's nested go to you know software update okay well you first you got to know where that is well it's in general so you got to scroll down until you find general and then uh, but here's your simple answer open settings put your finger in the middle of the iphone screen touch it and pull down about a quarter inch. And at the top, you'll get a little search window. Then you just type in update and it'll take you right to all your update settings. So I it's like it. one of those things that most of us probably know, but if you've ever found yourself scrolling and scrolling and hunting for a nested setting on your iOS device, just pull down. You got a search window at the top and it'll take you right to it. Super. Cool. I like it. No, I use it all the time. I, I, yeah, I use it all the time. So, uh, All right. John, you have, uh, speaking of finding menus on devices, you found some not quite e as some even harder to find things, didn't you? Yes. So um, I have a TCL Roku TV, Roku being the operating system. Yeah. Um, and it's really nice, but I was having an issue with certain shows being too dark. Oh, you mentioned this. Oh, okay. And, and I, you know, I searched, you know, I Googled it and I'm not the only one that had this problem. So I'm like, huh, well, is, is there a way to set HDR or other video parameters? And, and there is a way to set like the brightness and the contrast and stuff. But, uh, I did, uh, my instincts told me it was uh an hdr issue yeah i i would have agreed with you yeah yeah in it, 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 and i know you're going to share how you got there in the end was it an hdr issue did was that was disabling uh, it was, yes great okay now how'd you fix it um i went to the roku secret menu <laughs> oh really so yeah in one of the threads that i saw talking about this they're like hey by the way um there there's some menus that you don't get on normally get on the tv but there's a whole bunch of ones that are buried in there and maybe there's something geeky enough um that'll help fix your problem um so here are the menus that they give you um there's a wireless menu because it has wi-fi uh images and ads menu okay that, that sounds interesting um all right reset the secret menu um another secret menu Roku channel info secret menu, the HDMI secret menu. I think that's where I found the setting that fixed my problem. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So you can set the, you know, 4k frequency and, and, and stuff like that. Huh? Amazing. Wow. All right. Uh, cool. So you were able to turn off HDMI and, and now things don't get, get too dark for you. Or HDR. I, I fiddled HDR. With one of I didn't mean HDMI. I, 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 yes. I, no, I yes. think I fiddled with one of the Can HDMI Cancun settings. Mouth. Cool. Amazing. Huh. <clears throat> I would have thought. Yeah. Yeah. No, HDR sometimes. I mean, it depends on the TV and how it interprets it and all that stuff. But sometimes. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Very cool. Ooh, there's that sound. That sound means that I get to take a minute here and tell you about our sponsor, Collide. And Collide has some big news because if you're an Okta user, they can get your entire fleet to 100% compliance. How? Well, if a device as part of your network, as part of your user base isn't compliant, then that user can't log in to your cloud apps until after they've fixed the problem. It's that simple. Collide patches one of the major holes in zero trust architecture, device compliance. Without Collide, IT struggles to solve basic problems like keeping everyone's OS and browser up to date. Unsecured devices are logging into your company's apps because there's nothing there to stop them. 
Collide is the only device trust solution that enforces compliance as part of authentication right there at that moment. And it's built to work seamlessly with Okta. The moment that Collide's agent detects a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions to fix it. If they don't fix the problem within a set period of time, they're blocked. Collide's method means fewer support tickets, less frustration, and most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. Visit collide.com slash MGG to learn more or book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash MGG. And our thanks sincerely to Collide for sponsoring the show and sponsoring this episode. Hey, I just found out the average person has around 12 paid subscriptions. Think about that. If you think you're only subscribed to a handful of services, you might want to double check With our sponsor, Rocket Money, you can quickly identify and cancel all of your unwanted subscriptions. Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of us have a subscription or more than a subscription (laughs) that we've forgotten about. Like that streaming service that you bought just to watch one show on or that free trial that you've never even used. Rocket Money will quickly and easily identify all of your subscriptions for you. So you get to see and then you can stop paying for the ones that you don't want. When you don't want one, it's great. You just find the subscription you don't want in Rocket Money's interface and you press cancel. That's it. No more long hold times with customer service or tedious emailing back and forth. Rocket Money makes canceling subscriptions as easy as the click of a button. I've talked about it on the show. I've done this. It's amazing how simple it is. The Wall Street Journal is one of those companies that does not have a cancel button on their site. And the subscription is like 450 bucks or 500 bucks, even for like the, the quote unquote, you know, inexpensive digital only one or whatever. No. I like I, I didn't want to have to call them. I, my time is valuable. I, I want to spend my time prepping Mac Geek Cab and doing this show for you. And Rocket Money lets me because I just clicked cancel and they took care of it. So great. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash MGG. That's rocketmoney.com slash MGG. One more time. Rocketmoney.com slash MGG. And our thanks to Rocket Money for sponsoring this episode. All right, let's uh, let's take some questions here. Chuck sent in one that hopefully we can at least glean. We can come up with, well, we'll see where we go. He says, uh, my wife's new M2 MacBook Air uh, freezes every once in a while. She's using the Ventura. At the time he sent the email, it was 13.2. My guess is he has updated to 13.2.1. Uh, in fact, I know he hasn't. It hasn't fixed it. Fixed it. He says, uh, When it locks up, I try to force quit various apps to try to isolate the application that's causing the hangup. Okay. The trackpad click stops working, but I can move the cursor and use the return key to quit an app once the cursor is in the right place. But in that case, quitting the finder doesn't cause a restart even after manually force quitting each app until there's none left running. Save the finder. I finally resort to a manual shutdown by holding the power button. When I quit each app uh, one at a time, the lockup is not cured. I haven't checked the activity monitor yet to see if there's a memory hog bogging down the system, but uh, starting application uh, activity monitor could be complicated by these freezes because I can't click anything. By the way, my M1 Air also runs Ventura and doesn't have this problem. We just, we've made sure everything's up to date. Um, <clears throat> so this is an interesting one. It, 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 you know, looking at the symptom of it being, it seems like the trackpad simply stops letting him click or her click. And that's interesting because the trackpad is software based on these machines. Uh, I mean, it has haptic feedback. It's certainly a piece of hardware. It is sensing the pressure that you put on it, but it's not actually moving uh, in any way. So it makes sense if there's some software agent that, manages the trackpad if it gets hung up well no clicky my my first thought chuck is try using an external mouse like plug one in when this is happening can you click 
with that, like, is it something about the trackpad, either the hardware or the software? My guess is it's software because a reboot solves it. So it's probably not hardware. Um, but, you know, anything's possible. It's too consistent to be hardware, right? Like when this problem happens, it's that the trackpad stops, but a restart fixes it. That's why I'm thinking not hardware software. Um, but I could be wrong. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Please tell me. Uh, but um, F- f- feedback at MacGeekGab.com? That would yeah, be I think one. it was feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, guys. Yeah. I- I've got so, the answer. You have the answer, Pete. Go. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to stop con- rambling. It's an interrupt conflict. Right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Pete, get sorry, out. Sorry, dude. Get out. To... <laughs> get out. <laughs> I had to do that, man. I'm sorry. Right? Remember that That's... was back Oh, in the I day? remember. Yeah. 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 I, I can't believe you did that to me. Get out. That's it. You believe me, don't you? <laughs> You're uninvited. <laughs> oh, uh, well, you know what they say. You yeah, can't fix all... stupid. <laughs> yeah, all good things must come to an end. Um, well, that's what the software people say. That's right. Yeah. 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 And the hardware people say it's a software problem. No, it's that's a right. Hardware problem. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 like that would be my first test is, is this something about the operating system that's not letting anything click or is it that particular, you know, that, that haptically driven trackpad that's part of the, the MacBook air, whatever that software is. And I think, in fact, I know that there is also a way to trigger a click with the keyboard by leveraging accessibility. I don't know that that how to do that off the top of my head, but there is a way. So that would be another, if you don't have a third-party mouse with you and you experience this and or you know you're going to, it might not be a bad idea to set that up in advance so that at least you have a path that's better than power, you know, just force powering down the machine. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. TN Papa yeah. in the chat yeah. room. Yeah, yeah. The, he, he at, at MacGeekup.com slash Discord shares um again using activity monitor, so launching it, perhaps you'd have to just leave it launched all the time, which is not a terrible thing to do. But look in there for a stalled process. They generally appear in red. And that might help, you know, guide the, the troubleshooting path here. Yeah. I don't know. Anything else? Um, sometimes, yeah, it hasn't happened for a while, but, um, sometimes if your machine locks up and is non-responsive, um, if you, now normally you shouldn't do this, but I found sometimes that this can help analyze the problem. If you hold down the power key, the machine will shut down. And when you start it up, sometimes it will know that something terrible happened and it's like, Hey, do you want to see the crash report? I'm like, okay. Yep. Uh, and, and the crash report will show you, you know, hang or, you know, some other reasons um, that the computer got upset. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, what is it that, uh, that don't get old, it's bad for your memory. There, there's a process you can launch and you can look through all the logs that uh, also. Um... Uh, console. Console. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Would it be in console, you think? Or? I mean, maybe. <clears throat> Reading console logs in today's world, if, <laughs> in the last few versions of Mac OS. Got a, got a few hours? <laughs> it sucks. No, you, you have to. This is one of those things where it is a skill that you need to develop, and trying to do it for the first time in the moment of having an issue is, is just going to lead yeah. you down a path of desperation and, and frustration and probably smashing things. Um, but... The way to read console logs is to use the live filters. So it's essentially a search box in there. That, well, one way, I don't want to say the definitive way, but one way to sort of make sense of and, and start sort of, sort of you know, putting a, f- a filter on the river of, of crap that just pours out into the console. <laughs> it, yeah, is uh, the river of crap. Uh, it, it's a, it's like okay. There's a there's an image Competing. here and it's it's not exactly incorrect with what you yeah. get when you're looking because you, you're about as happy seeing seeing the river as, as you are seeing the console logs yeah. without making any sense of it. But you can put a live filter on it so it will only show you things that uh, are, you know, that match your filter it, again in real time. So uh, 
God, I, you know, I'm I'm usually <laughs> able to ignore the stuff in the chat room, guys, but <laughs> I can't. <laughs> They're not a sponsor. Um, I'm going to say no, it. Ca- Carn- you, Carnival is not a uh, I'll, You say it, Pete. Sure. <laughs> Tennessee Pop is in the chat room. Says, I think Carnival sails on that river. So <laughs> he may be right. <laughs> yeah. I'm usually pretty good at letting that stuff go and enjoying it without you're, sharing you're it. You're punchy today, Dave. You're punchy. I am you punchy today. Talk, and that's, you're ready to go to Mexico. <laughs> that is funny, though. Like, that's really funny. <laughs> I think Carnival sails on that yeah. river. My wife wow. being a travel agent, I'm going to share that with her. <laughs> Uh, all of you get out. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> um, but filtering it down, the problem with filtering it down, of course, is you need to know what to filter. And, and so, you know, like th- that starts to get sort of interesting, um, and also frustrating. You can experiment with things, you know, you might be able to look at trackpad. You might look at, uh, what is it? H I D. Right, because that's the human interface device. That's the, the the shortcut. But see, these are the things you would just sort of need to know from, say, doing a podcast for almost eighteen years, where you right. you, you dive into this stuff. Um, before that appeared in the chat room, <clears throat> someone Ev the Nerd asked any tips on how to read a, cra- a crash report. So I think this is more going back to not the console, but but your comment, John. What I do. I, I essentially read from top to bottom. Now at the very top is going to be some just setup information. Here's the version of Mac OS that's running. Here's the time, all of this you will see. And I don't have one in front of me to help you with this. I, I apologize. It's sort of an on the fly thing and, and maybe we'll revisit it. But in general, it will tell you somewhere in the first page, maybe page and a half before it starts listing all the processes and everything that was happening on the different threads. It will tell you which thread crashed or which process crashed. To me, that is the most important thing that as an end user, I can, uh, I can use. And so I will look for that. And if it says it's thread 15 that crashed, then you can scroll down to thread 15 and see what that thread was doing. You're going to see, I mean, you're going to see some things in there that are gibberish to all of us because we're not the developer of the, the software running in that thread, but there should be some things that resemble English words or some process names or application names or something where you're like, Oh, I see it was while it was, you know, indexing my photos that it crashed. So, okay. If this happens again, maybe I have a corrupted photo in there. Like, you know, those are the thought. I mean, I, I realize I'm like mixing examples here, but that's the kind of thing. That's how I read a crash log. I, I would be, I, that this would be a great thing to sort of crowdsource. I, I was going to say feedback at Mac but I would rather do this in Discord because we really get like the the hive mind together there. Sure. So MacGeekUp.com slash Discord. We'll start a thread about uh, how to read crash reports and the uh, in the live room because that's where it came up and uh, we'll go from there. So I don't know. Do you guys have any uh, any other thoughts? It's an interrupt conflict. <laughs> yep. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Um yeah, I don't. Uh, I, yeah, I don't think I have anything more on this. But hopefully, it's uh, hopefully checking the you know heading down the path of the mouse would would be the the answer there for you, Chuck. Uh, last episode, two episodes ago, and last episode, we talked about next next DNS uh, as a solution for a few different things, and listener Joe asked a pretty good question. He says, um, is it safe? A user on the Mac Power Users uh, forums proposed using NextDNS to block ads on Apple News, which are super annoying. The same ad appears over and over again each time, each screen that you scroll. And the idea was using NextDNS to uh, essentially make lookups to Apple's ad server fail. So from a, you know, from an engineering standpoint, I, I like this idea. Not a huge fan of ad blocking because my life has been supported by sponsors for a long time. I, I think you can do better by choosing sponsors that are actually at least you're interested in it. Your audience, therefore, might be interested in. You might not drive them crazy. We don't talk about the same sponsor 14 times in the same show. We talk about them twice, once at the beginning, once in the middle. That's my opinion on how to do sponsorship the right way. I, I totally uh, empathize with how Apple is doing it the wrong way. So 
I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily against this idea, but what that means is you're installing next DNS on your device. And Joe asks, is this safe? Are there any downsides you can think of? If I try to do it on my Mac or my iPhone, will it behave nicely with my Xfinity modem and my Eero? So I had never used next DNS, but I installed it. And, um, it's, it like, it seems fine. It, Next DNS gets to see all of your DNS lookups, as you might imagine, because they are all of your DNS lookups are redirecting through them. That's by design. That's how the service works. Um, there is one option in Next DNS that you would have to turn off, and that is the option that allows you to skip Next DNS on known Wi-Fi networks. So you can flag certain Wi-Fi networks and say, like, okay, on my home network, I don't need to use Next DNS. Uh, you know, on my work networks, I don't need to use it. I want to use the local DNS for for those. If you want to block ads on Apple News, you would have to let Next DNS run anywhere that you might read Apple News. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So you'd have to turn that part off. And that then might cause issues uh, if you are doing things that rely on your device using your local DNS, like custom DNS names. Uh, for your devices and and that sort of thing. So is it safe? I think so. Um, is it going to cause you any problems? Well, maybe, but you know, it's one of those things where try it out. If you start having problems, well, turn it off. Did the problems go away? Yes. Okay. Well, that might answer the question, then, you know? So yeah, I, I think it's okay to experiment with. Yeah. I, I, I mean, as a, as a company, um, it seems all right, as long as you're okay with them seeing, potentially seeing all of your, your lookups. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Any, any thoughts on that? Uh, Mr. Actually, I'm not going to ask you a yes or no question. That's my fault. What are your thoughts on that, John? Give it a whirl. It's, really? it's one part of the chain that you can use to, um, block certain content. So, yeah. Yeah. I personally don't use, um, a third party DNS. Yeah. Do you use Apple News? Do you read a lot of stuff in Apple News? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The ads don't drive you crazy? No. That's good. That's good. I, yeah, I yeah. think most people are are tolerant of ads that are not obtrusive. It's the ones that block the whole middle of your screen and are continuous. Like you said, and over and over and over again. I don't mind yeah. I don't mind a relevant ad. They're Same. great. You know, I, they I, can I be great buy stuff from sponsors. Right. It's like literally how you learn about products. Like there's it's yeah. ads aren't inherently bad. There are just many, many new ones every day. Bad ways of implementing ads. Yes. Yeah. And I, I yeah. don't think they're a current sponsor, but I, I know there's been shows that, you know, I've listened to one password and listened to their ad specifically to learn about a feature in it that may, I may or may not be using. So when it's done right. Yeah. That's. Yeah. We try to do it right. I do like that next DNS lets you do this on your iPhone because you could this idea of, of forcing a, a DNS uh, redirect or a DNS lookup to fail is a time honored practice, right? You know, that whole concept of going and downloading a, 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 what we call a hosts file of yeah. all the known ad servers and installing that on your Mac to cause all those redirects to, or those lookups to fail then keeps the ads from appearing. It's just sort of the way it works. If you can't right. do the DNS lookup, can't load the content. The problem is you can't implement that on an iPhone uh, the way you can on a Mac. You can't get to the terminal on an iPhone and, and edit the Etsy host file and yeah, and all that. So like next DNS, it's cool that it, it, it sort of steps in the way of that and lets you do that. It's a, it's a different, I'd never used an app like next DNS before. John, you should check this out. Just the way you turn it on and you have to go in and like give it permission to interrupt your DNS queries. I didn't even know that that was a thing on the iPhone. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. The thing is, when it, and the, I think the other thing you want to do is be careful of being too aggressive on your ad blocking because it will become a cat and mouse game that makes yeah. them so obtrusive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I get, it could get worse. Yeah. Pop up blockers failed for a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I think. Yeah. If if you know how if you know how to code, I think you can detect somebody who's blocking ads and not render the page properly because yep. 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's oh, on the web. It's super easy to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People hate you when you do that. By the way, we tried that at Mac Observer. I mean, we tried a lot of things at Mac Observer. You know, but uh, but yeah, people 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 were furious about that. I was like, why are you furious? You're trying to you know, the price for viewing our content is looking at our ads that we choose to show you. Like <laughs> it's okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, Chris. We let you skip your ad, the ads here. I don't know if, how many of you know, like in general, I don't know how many of you know about chapters here on Mac Geek Cap. Uh, we chapterize everything. So most podcast players now, we've been doing this for, you know, 16, 17 of our almost 18 years. But uh, now most pod, pod catchers, the apps that you use to play podcasts, support chapters. So you can jump around from segment to segment. Like, for example, I just started a new chapter uh, at the 50 minute and four second mark here for this particular like side discussion. So if you don't care about this, you can skip it. If you want to come back to it, you can skip it. I put chapters around every ad. So if you already know about a sponsor, if you're already a, a customer of them, you don't care to learn about any of the new tips that might be in the ad, you skip right over. It's totally fine. Uh, you know, if people think we're crazy for letting you do that. We've been letting you do that since early, early on. And I think it has worked out to our mutual benefit. Our, ours here as the publishers of the show, but yours as the listeners too. We're all adults here. Um, you know, ch choose what you want to do. Does it help us when you visit the sponsor's webpage and consider their product? Yes. Uh, sometimes it even helps us if you buy, we don't get like a commission on it, but you know, they, they track that stuff and then they might renew. So it is good for us if you look at the sponsors, but I'm not going to beat you over the head with it. Like, you know, but yeah, the chapters you use for all kinds of things. So yeah, check them out in your podcast app. Yeah. It's a cool thing. Um, Chris started as a question and thankfully it ended with Chris figuring out his problem. Cause I don't know that I would have ever thought of this. So I'll share his question and then I'll just jump sort of to the answer, but just so we can have some, some context here. He says, I have a weird Safari issue. It is syncing, mimicking, mirroring between my Mac Studio and my M2 MacBook Air. Uh, he says, I've got a, a, and he describes his computers, all running the, the latest Ventura 13.2.1. He says, I typically run my iMac and Mac Studio simultaneously with universal control to expand my screen real estate. And I will tell you, him saying that was a huge red herring. Because it made us dive down the path of universal control and it wasn't this. Um, he says, this morning I decided to update my MacBook Air and play with it. And instantly, when opening Safari, I noticed that whatever was opened on my MacBook Air was mirroring on my Mac Studio and vice versa. And so it really came down to all three devices. If he did something in Safari on one device, it would happen on the other it wasn't like he was controlling the mouse or the keyboard. It was that he was controlling Safari and only Safari. But it was near instantaneous that he would open a new tab, do a thing, and boom, Safari would mirror on all of his devices. I, you know, couldn't figure it out for a little bit. Uh, and he says, uh, I got caught with tab groups. He says... Uh, Turns out that using tab groups in Ventura, the changes, assuming you're connected to the internet and everything, all else is equal. The changes are near instantaneous. So being inside the same tab group on all three uh, devices caused that tab group then to, you know, update in real near real time uh, and and have a, a somewhat mirrored experience. If you were to type something into like a web form on one computer that wouldn't appear on the other, but having those tab groups come up, uh, does sync it up. So it, it interesting. I I'm, I'm sure there are scenarios where this could actually be leveraged in an interesting way. You know, some kind of kiosk type scenario. I don't know. Like there's something here, but, um, but good to know if you start seeing Safari, if, if there's ghosts in the Safari, then, uh, then maybe you'll know why. So thank you for sharing that with us, Chris, and thank you for figuring it out. Cause I don't know if we ever would have, I, uh, I, I don't use tab groups. I, I need to dig into them though. Like, I think I probably could get a lot of use out of them, but I, 
uh, the the new version, the new implementation of tab groups is very different than what it you know what it was in the past. So, yeah, I don't know. Thoughts? Anything, John? No. Any? What are your thoughts on that? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. Everybody out. Uh, <laughs> all right, Pete. Uh, in 968, we uh, talked about uh, photos of some sort and, and digitizing them, I think, right? Uh, maybe not. Maybe yeah. I'm, so uh, yeah. I don't know if it was in the show or not. We got a question, though, from Tony C., who lives in Thailand, uh, and he's back in the States this week, but uh, visiting to yeah. the family. But uh, he asked about digitizing photos, um, and we had two different answers for him. Um, my answer was, uh, just because my wife about, uh, probably about two years back needed to digitize a bunch of photos and wouldn't take my suggestion, which is to use your day gum phone. You know, it works good, works good, lasts a long time. Uh, but I get it because there's reflections and inconsistencies and keystone issues and all that. If you're using your phone, unless you're using a perfect stand of some sort. So she bought a flatbed scanner, a, uh, Epson v39 scanner and it was it's 109 dollars, and it does a fabulous job of scanning your photos putting them out digitizes them all and uh, we've had good success with that taking our old paper particularly the older paper photos that were never digital of your grandparents and sure grandparents and that sort of thing i have one of my great grandfather who was uh, a head swimming coach at pennsylvania for 40 years and wow yeah those are all digitized now, but they, they weren't back in the day. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, right, right. <clears throat> no digital cameras in the 19-teens. No, it turns out there weren't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Huh? So, and it works ones. well for you, huh? Yeah, for 109 bucks. Yeah, yeah. I've got it. Uh, we, we put a link in the, in yeah. the show notes for it. And, and you had suggested a, a third-party service. Do you have any in particular? Or? I don't have any in particular. My, my thought process was, look, you know, if this is something you're going to do over and over again, then, you know, certainly consider hardware um, because in the end it's going to be – you're going to save money. You won't necessarily save time, but you will save money. If it's a one-time thing, my ad advice is – go to the pros, you know, they, they've done this many times before. Uh, you, you, you just give them your photos and, and then they give you a, you know, a memory stick back is usually how it works these days. It yeah. used to be a CD or, you know, or, may, or that maybe they're just online and you download them now. I don't know. But, um, but there, there are plenty of services out there uh, that will do this and, and they'll get it right for you. Whereas, you know, scanning them yourself, you might get halfway through and then realize, oh, you know, if I did it this way or if I set the resolution like that, I might be happier in the end in two years. And so now you're going back. And I mean, don't get me wrong. Obviously, we're all about like learning geeky skills here. Right. But if it's truly a one time thing and you, you just can't imagine needing to do it again maybe this isn't a skill you need to or want to develop. If it is a skill you want to develop, then by all means, you know, down the road. Go. I will add, though, that uh, if, if you do send them off, by all means, please, 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 particularly if it's irreplaceable, make sure you have some sort of a copy. Probably yeah. the coolest photo ever taken of me was when I, was, when I landed in A4 on the deck of the USS Lexington, my hook was in the wire, and my wheel, my main mounts were smoking, and somebody snapped it at that perfect <sighs> instant. I sent the negative off to have it blown up into a poster and never saw it again. No. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, you got to oh. be kidding me. I mean, if this was, you know, magazine cover quality photo. Oh, it was me Pete, landing the airplane. Sucks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right, right. It's like, oh. oh. I'm sorry I'll, to hear I'll, that, man. Yeah. I'll suggest another one. I've, I've used uh, Epson scanners in the past um if you're willing to spend a little bit more money um they have one called the epson fast photo ff 680w okay um right. the thing is is that it has a tray so you don't have to so you could oh. you can put a whole bunch of photos in it so like it's a copy machine almost uh yeah, as as yeah. pretty much and and yeah. high speed huh. photo and document scanner 
Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so quite a bit more money four five times oh, yeah. the price, but, but if you're doing hundreds of these things, mm. this would perhaps save your sanity. Um, there's no hope for mine folks, but there is hope for yours. Yeah. And there's I will that. add one other last thing along this line. If you're going to use a scanner there and you're buried in your monthly paper and all that stuff, David Sparks did a field guide several years back called paperless and he talks about how to use a scanner to digitize all your your statements as they come in though most people will allow you to download your statements and that sort of thing anymore but there's other paper that you want to keep digitize them and then you know unless you need the originals like all the all the mortgage closing statements oh yeah stuff, digitize them shred them so. yeah yeah, and having a, a, yeah. a sheet feeder for that kind of stuff makes a huge difference. My, my Lexmark laser printer uh, has, I mean, I bought it this way. It wasn't like yeah. it just came by surprise, but it is, it is a multifunction device, and it has a sheet feeder on it that will do double-sided stuff. In right. fact, it even prints double-sided. Having a double-sided printer it, it, in 2023, it's, you are, it, it sounds ridiculous for me to be excited about being able to print double-sided. Right. It is a game changer for all, like there are some things for work that we just need to have printed because we use them in a way that, you know, and being able to print stuff, even set lists for the band, right? Like, I mean, I print a set list before every gig because trusting an electronic device to can keep everybody on the same page no bueno, right? You know, it's got to be. But if I want to put the set list, I, what I'll normally do for the band is, you know, I, I print out one page that's the the set list and then a second page that is what I call my back pocket songs that if if we don't want to play a certain song or we need extra songs, it's like what's in the back pocket? Here it is. Well, the back pocket was always a second piece of paper and it was, you know, it start floating around the, the, the stage pretty quickly. Now... It's literally on the back. You know, I just flip, if I need it, you know, break glass in case of emergency, flip paper in case of emergency, you're good right. to go. There it is. There's those tunes. So yeah. having a double sided printer, I, I, I can't stress enough how 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 much we all appreciate that. But the sheet feeder is also a double sided sheet feeder. So for things like those mortgage docs and, and you know, that it makes yeah. a huge difference to be able the to, printer to I just buy, I'll do that. I don't have that current capability. But, uh, well, it, the next time you need to do that, come on over, Pete. You're you're welcome to use mine. There you yeah. go. There you go. Yeah. And the yeah. other thing I thought about um, while you were talking was uh, in that field guide it, 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 that I got out of it many years ago is like naming conventions. He talks about all that, so you can go back and find your stuff. Um, mm. he does a nice job of putting those things. So he he does a real good, well thought out. Here's how you get from paper to paperless. So. Nice. I put a link to to Max Sparky's paperless field guide in uh, in the show notes at MacKeyCup.com. So, uh, last episode in nine sixty nine, we were talking about cloud services and such, and uh, and listener Adam asked. He said, uh, he says about backups. You were talking about iCloud Drive and Synology Drive, and it gave me an idea. Would it be crazy to just migrate all my documents that I keep in iCloud Drive over to Synology Drive? Because if I did this, I could theoretically reduce my iCloud plan to a cheaper tier and save a bunch of money. What would the pitfalls of this be? And yeah, I, I mean, I, I sort of glossed over this as an option when we were having that conversation. It is, in a sense, what I do uh, that I, I store my my sort of main documents archive that goes back decades is on my Synology drive and therefore sync to all of my devices. For those of you that, that don't yet know Synology drive is, uh, is an app that you, I mean, it's a, it's a server based thing that sits on your disk station, but it's also an app that you run on your Mac similar to Dropbox. And it just keeps things in sync. And you can of course selectively sync different folders on different devices and all that fun stuff. Um, and it's what I do, and it allows me, A, to keep my data mine, and B, um, it's my storage, not not someone else's that I have to pay a subscription for. I choose my words carefully there because I do have to pay for the storage. I had to buy the hard drives, and when they die, I got to replace them. So um, the only pitfall that I run into with this is that the integration is non-native compared to iCloud Drive which means that 
specifically on iOS. On the Mac, it's it's seamless. I don't even think about it. On iOS, Synology Drive has integration with Apple's Files app. It's like kind of wonky in that when you bookmark something, sometimes the bookmarks disappear. This is not specific to Synology Drive. I have the same problem with Google Drive and Dropbox on the, you know, the integration with the Files app. It's just not perfect. The, the Files app, I guess, maybe the APIs for it or something are just not perfect. But uh, I mean, otherwise, yeah, it's totally fine. I can I can navigate to things and get there and do what I need to do. So uh, I would try it out. If you've got a Synology, yeah, try it out and see. The other question is, how much data are you storing in your iCloud drive that you could move to your Synology drive? And will it make a difference in the your storage requirements for iCloud drive? It may or may not. Depends on what kind of data and how much you're storing uh, on iCloud drive. So, um, Yes. My other thought. All right. So iCloud is obviously in the cloud. Yeah. Um, and Synology drive, if you use Synology drive, there is the potential for you to put it both on the Synology and the cloud. Though I haven't played with it, and I should. They call it hybrid cloud. Mm. So the data is in, in multiple places. So that, that would be my only comment is, uh, you know, you yeah. want to consider that to get some redundancy. Sure. Sure. Some some storage redundancy. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Um, you just increase because you do. I think you do similar to me, John. That you have you use Synology Drive as well as iCloud Drive, and right. in in the last episode you said you increased your storage for iCloud Drive. I, my assumption, but I hate to just gloss over it, is not you did that not because your document storage started increasing, but because your photo storage started increasing. Is that right? That's my suspicion. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, you can look. Like iCloud Drive will tell you what where where your storage is being used if you um, oh, yeah. if you no, launch and, systems. And that's what led me. Lean forward, talk into the mic, please. And that's what we like to me. hear you. That w that's what led me to get more space because yeah, at one point I was in the uh, iCloud settings and I was like, oh, manage storage, and I'm like, oh wow, I didn't know I was taking up that much. Mm, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Because it'll it'll break it down too. It'll show like. What, mm -hmm. what percentage of it is photos and what is, you know, documents versus, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, all the other things. So but you, you do not want your photos library on your Synology, correct? Well, you, you know, Except if there's a backup, you don't want to work off of it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Your live yeah. photos library, if you are using Apple's photos app, right. Right. I, I, that is a hundred percent correct. It, yeah. it like, you know, you can't store Apple's photos on a network drive of any kind and have it be reliable. It needs to be on a local drive. I also, and I can't caution enough, would not have your photos library set up to two-way sync between any devices. One-way sync, great. You know, have what's on your Mac sync to, you know, your network storage device so that you've got a backup. Awesome. Awesome two-way sync between two Macs that's not like you if you want to do that you use iCloud photos it, trying to do it another way is you, you know be, beware there may be dragons like yeah. I can't stress enough yeah so there is a Synology photos app and apparently that works very well I haven't tried that yes but, yeah Th so that is separate that yes se totally separate app correct it's a Synology Sep app so. It's a Synology app, and you sync with that in a different way. You don't sync with that from from photos uh, on the on the phone. Your photos library can populate your Synology photos app, and then it syncs it differently from there forward. But yes, there is yeah. that. So yeah. So that's also kind of a one way sync from photos into another app. Yeah, you're doing it one yeah. way, so you don't. Yeah, you know, so it doesn't corrupt it. That's right. Yeah. That, that's that's the reason I still pay for iCloud and a lot of iCloud. It's yeah. just the the danger of putting it on one drive in my basement and not having a failure or the house burned down and losing everything just isn't worth it to me. That's it's cheap insurance not to yeah. lose photos of the kids. Oh, 100%. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I sync them to iCloud photos and I do the same thing. I have a copy on my on my Synology. And then I actually do have Synology photos feed from that copy. That yeah. lives on my thing. I don't sync it from any of my devices. I just have it see it locally. Uh, that's enough. So for lots me. of layers, which is a good. Lots thing. of layers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We got time for one more thing. I'm going to share 
uh, in a recent episode, John uh, and Pete, we were talking about whether it was possible to uh, stream from our library, stream video content from our libraries. John, you were saying you go to your library, you rent Blu-rays from them. You know, we, we have Libby for books where we can get books digitally without having to go to the library. Is there a way to stream from uh, video content from your library? And uh, Andrew, the 8,764th specifically in Discord says uh, your libraries might have digital video streaming via either Canopy with a K or Hoopla. Libraries usually have a download or streaming tab on their homepages and then list one or both of those services, though sometimes they'll get buried in the list of databases. I'll put links to Canopy and Hoopla in the show notes, but really uh, it's, you know, check with your library because that's where this starts. But but that would be the uh, the thing to ask. So thank you for for um, for sharing that. Andrew, this 8,764th. Dave, what's that background well, noise? That's the band, man. That's just how it be. What? All We're good things fun. must come to an end. I know. You're having too much fun. You've got to get out. No. <laughs> uh, time this for you has to been go fun. to Mexico, man. <laughs> it is almost time for me to go to Mexico. That's right. I, got, uh, I think I have one more podcast to record this afternoon, and I probably should make sure I packed enough bathing suits. So. Too. Yeah, yeah, but uh, the schedule won't, my, my travels as usual won't interrupt the show release schedule, we're trucking on forward, so we will see you next week. We had a fantastic hangout uh, for our, uh, it was basically a home networking hangout. And I missed we- it. And Pete missed it. Yeah, I've, I've scheduled the next one. I don't know what the topic is. It doesn't really matter what the topic is, it turns out. We, uh, I mean, we will have one. We will come up with one uh, for the next one. But really, what what's great is just getting a bunch of us together. I think we had, I don't know, 30, maybe 40 people in there uh, awesome. on, on Sunday. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Uh, the next one is at 4 p.m. Eastern time on March 26th. Uh, if you subscribe to the Mac Geek Gab calendar, it's already there. If you subscribe to the Mac Geek Gab newsletter, you will get a notification about it in your email box. And of course, if you join the Discord at macgeekgab.com slash Discord, we will make sure to put a reminder about it there. So, uh, so yeah, we'll do a, you know about one a month on these, and uh, we'll have some fun with it. So March 1 is March 26th, Sunday, uh, March 26th at 4 p.m. Eastern. But as we talked about at the top of the show, put this subscribe to the calendar. It will put it on your calendar in your time zone so that we're all actually in sync and you'll be there at the right time. Thanks for uh, thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Thanks to Cashfly for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Thanks uh, for checking out Pilot Pete's other show, So There I Was. Us. Thanks for checking out my other shows too, Business Brain. Show. Uh, we have changed the format there and y'all and I mean the, the listeners of that show which includes some of you really seem to like it shorter form episodes with with quick actionable sort of business uh, tips and advice businessbrain.show so check that out too and then of course there's gig gab at giggabpodcast.com for musicians and people who want to sort of hear how the sausage is made uh, of being in a band and playing and all that good stuff so thanks for hanging out with us thanks for checking out our sponsors of course, as we discussed in the show, rocketmoney.com slash MGG and collide.collide, K O L I D dot com slash MGG. Fun stuff. I love it when we can get together like this. Pete, what's it say on the back of your shirt there? Oh, wait, John, uh, Pete's turned around. What's, what's Pete's, the back of Pete's shirt say? Or is it the front? It's the front. Nope, no, it's the back. What's the back say? Uh, Mac Geek Gab. It's the Mac Geek Gab logo. What's the front say? Don't get caught. Made up. Later. <laughs>